currently there doesn't seem to be a limit um so in terms of how big this could be it could be massive think about the charity stuff that you could potentially do um or the fund fundraising right you've raised funds before i mean adam think about it um uh, you know if you if we start getting into the habit of doing this then and not overuse it not abuse it then it could potentially be a very very large attraction channel for whatever it is that you want to be doing so it's um it's very very exciting yeah um anyway folks um we're live everybody uh welcome to brain food live on air episode 203 bringing it to you every friday no fail um and uh, we were adam and i were just chit chatting because we we're experimenting with the new feature from restream um and it's very exciting we think it has huge potential um because you should be watching this of course on crowdcast maybe on my LinkedIn or maybe on my Twitter or whatever it is, but you can also watch it on Adam's YouTube now and you can watch it on Simon's LinkedIn and you can watch it on Jade's LinkedIn. Um, so what we've actually managed to do, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, folks, um, is that we're multi-streaming across other people's social channels. Uh, now have a think about this from a recruitment point of view and why that could be significant. Um, uh, you could be interviewing a hiring manager doing it on live stream and then getting your entire team to restream that conversation out. Do you not think that would be massive distribution for your job um, and for your EB? Um, it could be huge. Nobody else is doing it um, apart from apart from us. So well done, Brain Fooders. Well done, Stephen O'Donnell, by the way, the first guy who showed me the technique and how to do this. Um, but, I, but yeah, I, I mean, I do think this is a game changer, is it not? Um, anyway, let's do some sound checks to make sure everything's okay. Uh, folks, if you can hear me all right on Crowdcast, please do let me know. Uh, let me know in the chat there whether that's fine. Um, if you can hear me on LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever it is that you're watching, uh, drop me a comment in there and let me know you can hear me there also. 4chan. Um, 4chan. I'm not quite there, mate. I streamed um, it to my 4chan. I, I, I hope you didn't. Um, I, I thought I'd... I don't want to sort of attract uh, certain types mm. of people. I think, you know, if we keep some sort of distance, that would be all good. Um, but yeah, um, uh, yeah, I think people can hear us fine, which is good stuff. Um, so let's get on with the, the, the chat. We have to, of course, thank our sponsors every week, folks. Uh, without sort of a sponsor support, Brain Food Live does not continue. We know times are tough also, mm -hmm. but it doesn't stop them from making sure these conversations keep going. Um, so I have to thank our sponsors. Uh, this week, our sponsors are Greenhouse, uh, one of the leading ATS providers. Um, uh, certainly in the, in the new wave, they've done some fantastic things. I know a lot of you are very popular, uh, sort of very um, uh, avid users of the software. And if you remember the Brain Food, uh, sort of what what would you what what the recruiters want survey two years ago, Greenhouse were way out in front as the most popular ATS for the community. Um, so uh, do check the company out. They've had some tough news, of course. Um, yesterday they had to make um, some cutbacks. Um, that's not unusual, I'm afraid to say. Um, almost all uh, uh, businesses that are servicing our industry, I think, are feeling that that pressure as well. Um, we've simply had to redraw uh, sort of our ambitions in, in terms of where we're looking at in terms of global growth and economic growth and so forth. Um, but do check Greenhouse out. They're still iterating on great products. They've got three great products actually uh, already released in Q1. Uh, this is a salary transparency tool, which we all care about. Um, this is also a personal goals manager as well, which can help teams kind of align on goals and what they want to do and maintain accountability. Um, and they've also got a new onboarding product as well. Um, so do make sure you check out Greenhouse. I'm going to share um, their latest features here. Oh, by the way, they've actually got two sessions where they're sort of doing a how-to on these features. Um, so if you are a Greenhouse user, you probably want to sign up to one of these webinars. I think they're happening early May, um, and they can basically give you the best practice on how to use them um, if you do want to get involved. So um, check it out over there. There is the link, um, and I'll uh, kind of loop that around as well a bit later uh, when the uh, sort of at the end of the show. Okay, cool. Let's get on with our chat. Um, Adam Gordon, good to see you in the uh, in the co-pilot seat as usual. Um, how have you been? Um, and how was your week, sir? Was it uh, was it as fun as you imagined? Yeah, I've had a really great week. I've got absolutely no idea what I did. I can't remember anything about it. That's the sign. That's a Scotsman sign of a great week, folks. Um, no drink like, or drugs or anything. I just memory, can't really remember. Collapse. 
by the way, I've adopted your technique of doing non non alcoholic beers, um, which I was a skeptic of for a long time because I thought, you know what, if I'm not drinking alcohol, just go and buy something that's obviously non alcoholic. Um, but I've discovered it's very hard to do that in a book in a pub um, because you, you either drink the soft drink too quickly and you have to keep ordering these cokes and your teeth start rotting, um, or you end up like ordering a cup of tea at like 11, 8, 11 p.m. or something. <laughs> you know, guy doesn't want to make you hard drink. Um, so yes, um, basically non-alcoholic beer is the way forward. I, I, this is it. This is it. It's it's it's, uh, it's the future. Unfortunately, as as is very unusual, I remain a step ahead of you because I'm having a lot less of those now because of the carb con <laughs> content. Now, the carb content turns into glycogen in your system, and that's just sugar. Um, so although it doesn't taste sweet, um, still makes you fat or makes me fat. So I'm really? having a lot less of them. But one thing I do have is uh, I have tonic water. I have low-calorie tonic water because it's got quite a sophisticated flavor, and you don't guzzle it. It's nice. I, I can't, I can't, like, I, I just quaff that too quickly. Um, so I need to find a solution because I, I, I'm i also too fat. Um, so uh, so I need to, you know, do something about that rapidly. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to, like, hot countries in about two weeks, uh, which means basically I'm going to obviously, you know, enjoy the beach, um, which also means I need to lose this belly, ASAP. Um, I might well go on, 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 like, a fruitarian diet for next week or so see what happens just you know don't eat fruit Fruit, fruits rammed with sugar sugar's fine it's carbs that kill you um anyway um let's let's get on with it did you read the newsletter if so what was interesting man yeah um let's talk about andy owen first the pity city ceo um so she did a pep talk with her sales teams um and it came across as really patronizing and um she used some quite strange language um anyway the the main point is however somebody recorded it and shared it online now no matter how much of a doofus your you know colleague is i feel like you should really just keep these things inside the business she wasn't being like hyper offensive she was just being a bit patronizing um there's a lot of um there's a lot of this happening doxing right and um you know it's like the cry well i mean the crying ceo put it online didn't he He, well that wasn't doxing um he just he just did it uh but as you said in the newsletter i do think that um i do i I do i do think that um it's really tough to be a ceo these days you can't like anything you say somebody doesn't like it and nearly because everybody's got a different perspective as well you could say something that some people are motivated by and others think is crass or whatever um it's really hard to to lead and um you know but then again they get paid the big bucks for that particular reason danger That's money true. it's danger money but I, you know what i do have sympathy for it. folks i don't know whether you, you're aware of this particular episode but it was a ceo of i think some uh, design company she did an internal zoom uh, she used a few t- few terms again weren't terrible but the, the pity city was one of those so she was kind of shaming these salespeople for complaining or something um, and someone obviously recorded that and, you know, blasted it out online. And this lady got absolutely roasted. Andy's a woman, a woman by the way. She, she got absolutely roasted for it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the two minds, obviously, CEOs need to be very much more conscious of their media. Like, there's nothing really that's internal. It's everything is leakable. Um, and an, an innocuous email or an email or a message or something where you, you're at a heightened emotional state and you haven't really kind of thought too much about it, you really need to not send that because it, it's going to go out. Um, and and yeah, it's an unfortunate sort of um, development of where we're at, but um, you can see that this is the future. It's going to be hard to kind of uh, um, reverse the trend. Um, and I think we're just going to have to assume that everything might just be broadcast. And, you know, that's a sad situation because if you look at anybody's private DMs or whatever, Every, there's a sackable offense in that if you go back far enough, you know. Um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a scan. I, I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for someone to fish out, a, you know, a, a Twitter DM from 2010 or something. And there's some sort of, you know, offbeat joke that was totally right in context. But, you know, <laughs> these days it's like completely destructive. It's going to happen, isn't it? Um, I know. So. It's, it, one, one interesting factor is the, the ruthlessness that's often needed for somebody to progress 
their career to the hot seat of CEO is often slightly in conflict with the empathy they need to immediately start to be able to, uh, uh, you know, convey. Um, these two things are not always inbuilt to the same individuals. No, I, and I think sometimes a CEO needs to be tough. Um, and, and toughness, by the way, you could take that description of toughness as lacking in empathy. Someone who is, for, for instance, upset at the toughness would say, you, you have no empathy or you're bullying me. I had a friend of mine, actually, who, sadly enough, she, uh, he works in a TA, had to make 50% of, her, of the team redundant over the last week. Uh, over, over a two-day period so a big chunk of, chunk of his team had to go um and uh, he said look most people dealt with it all right but he he had two screaming matches with people who were very upset at the decision um and and just lost it uh, and then you know obviously you have to just bring hr in and bring in you know employee relations and all this type of stuff so you, you yeah I, I don't think employees can necessarily take uh, a position where we, which I identify as an employee, are always going to be like the rational thinker. You know, we're also lacking in empathy at times. We're certainly not empathetic with the CEOs ever. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're quite happy to throw them under the bus when uh, when it, it's socially approved and, you know, we get some bra internet brownie points. Um, so, so, yeah, it's really tough. But, you know, maybe the future is automated CEO anyway. Get rid of the problem by getting rid of the, 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 the biological human. Just get a robot to do it. Um, there was also there was an also an element of it which was really it was it was salespeople right she was talking to and mm. she was she was saying basically stop crying that you're not going to get your bonus and just smash your targets and make sure you get it um, you know and um, there was some sort of suggestion that there was some sort of suggestion that she was saying I'm getting my bonus anyway so I don't care but I didn't actually hear that in the in the clip i heard no it turned out she got her bonus anyway um and it wasn't discussed in the call um so that obviously added to the right. um added to the story and and hence you know absolutely accusations of lack of empathy i think are accurate all that type of stuff is is totally correct um but the, the wider story is is like can a ceo actually have a tough conversation um it, privately um or do we now need to assume everything is public and just behave in that way which I think will reduce candor. Um, uh, you know, if, if everything is automatically public, I think about all the private conversations you have with your partner or your family or your friends or whatever. If you knew all of that's recorded and could be live streamed, you're going to stop talking to them. Um, so, uh, so I think there's, we're, we're encountering a problem. Interestingly enough, I surveyed the Brain Food community about that on the newsletter, and like, yeah, most of us were pro pro, <laughs> pro doxing. It was like quite a disappointing result. Um, everyone said, yeah, she deserved it. I was like, oh my goodness, we have a very un un unsympathetic crowd here. Um, but there we go. There's, 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 there's that's what we're looking at. Give okay. us a couple more. Yeah, um, I re really, really enjoying Ben Phillips's series on recruitment marketing. It's very much a simple, simply described, here's how to for lots of different elements of recruitment marketing. Um, he writes the way I think he probably speaks. I don't know the guy, so I I'm not sure, but he writes in a conversational tone. It's really easy to follow. It's quite, you know, humorous and he's engaging and uh, absolutely love it. Anybody that wants to know more about recruitment marketing, then they should uh, follow that series for sure. It was originally meant to be two, then he increased it to three, and it looks like it's being increased to four as well. I haven't seen if there's a fourth yet, but he said there's there, going to be. There is a fourth. I'm gonna. I'm oh. now. I'm gonna have to stick it in because I've I've put one, two, and three into the series. It's a really good series. Ben's actually a very um, obviously very credible individual, and but he's quite a new writer. Um, so I don't think he he kind of did a lot of this blogging business. Uh, but he started this journey and, and uh, I think it's very fresh because he's coming at it, um, uh, you know, having, having not done that or a lot of writing. Um, and I think it's very accessible, which, uh, which a lot of the uh, how-to stuff sometimes can be a bit obtuse, but you, anybody can read this and get it. Um, and I think, number one, great refresher for anybody who already knows the, the material, but it's a great refresher reminder. Um, but for anybody who doesn't know the material, how to do recruitment marketing, employer branding, et cetera, how to operationalize some of these ideas, it's a must read. Uh, so just shared it in the uh, uh, sort of the chat stream there on Crowdcast. Please do uh, take a look at it. Ben, by the way, will be on Brain Food Live in a couple of weeks when we're talking about how to measure the impact of EV. So um, uh, that's uh, you can get to chat to him uh, directly in a couple of, a couple of weeks. Okay, one more, mate, before we get into it. 
Okay, well, let's talk about um, <clears throat> recruitment in Georgia. The Georgian National Guard, <clears throat> while we're on the subject of recruitment marketing, have been using an interesting method of getting messages, like spear phishing right to the people they need. The unusual bit, however, is it's children. So they're looking at targeting uh, children to come and join the, the National Guard. And the way they're doing it is geofencing around 60, 65 or something high schools. And so people on their mobile phones are getting messages coming in based on the location and the location being the school. So a uh, bit controversial. Sure, it'll work. We yeah. need to be a lot more focused with our own recruitment marketing. I never thought I would say we need to look at the Georgian National Guard as being you know, the ones as the case study to follow, but there we go. Yep, I think a contra I think there's two two elements here. I think technically um, we can understand here is an, a, a really smart and effective method of recruitment marketing. Think about like sending a geofenced app to a mobile device to where a bunch of people you know are going to be around. For instance, this week, obviously, we had Unleash in, in Las Vegas, Unleash America, apparently massive event. If I was recruiting a recruiter, um, I would be using a geofenced ad um, in, you know, the Bellagio or something, um, and I'd be sticking ads out there um, because it, it this will basically d distribute to an audience that's highly likely to be within our space. Um, uh, you, so I think conference-based recruiting, this makes sense. If you're recruiting people at a university campus, you know that the STEM department is in this area, just put the ads in wherever anybody walks past the STEM sort of lecture hall. Um, you know, every time they do that, pop comes an advert, very, very smart. So I think technically it's there, give me a sec, but obviously we, we, we're not that comfortable with, you know, recruitment into military um, in, in many cases and particularly not for young, young younger people. So uh, I don't think they're quite children. I think maybe that's the politics of the uh, uh the publisher coming out i think he intercepts quite left wing um but um i, I don't know what qualifies as a, as a child in the us i mean is it under 18 in which case they probably are kids um why don't we do like why if i was hsbc i'd probably just like aim lots of adverts like if i was hsbc and canary wharf the barclays building's just the other side of the plaza pl blitz the entire building with adverts for working at hsbc <laughs> I don't think people know about it. I mean, folks, have you tried geofenced, geo-targeted advertising? So this is going to a mobile device. We don't care about the web. We're literally going to stick it in your mobile device, tracking GPS. There's a few companies that do this. Crouton, quite right, Stephen. Um, they're one of the businesses in the UK that are doing this. Um, but have you thought about this? Do you know of a supplier in your industry uh, that also does this work? It seems to make sense to me. Um, and because you can, you know, there's certain people that just simply, why would they ever be there? Um, you know, if I'm recruiting a sewage worker or something like that, go to a sewage place. <laughs> you know what I mean? And who else is going to be there? Um, so look at London, you got lawyer, you got certain areas of the city that are dedicated to certain types of work. Lawyers are going to be in, you know, near the courts of justice, so all the, all the, the ends of court and stuff like that. Everybody there's a lawyer, you're hiring a lawyer, boom, put adverts, geofence there. Um, so it's not it's not new sense. it's not new though it's not new technology it's technology that's been around for a long long time but we definitely should be making more of it in in recruitment marketing and the other yeah. thing we should be making more of um, is uh, putting putting ad which I used to do back in the early two thousands is putting big forty eight sheet adverts outside your competitor's office especially if they are a work from office employer. Yeah, I suppose I'll tell you what, remote working kills this, doesn't it? But um, yeah, if the, the people who have to go in to the yeah. office, this is this is actually very effective. And and yeah, it's not it's not new. Um, I think location-based ads have been served usually for consumer stuff as well, but I, I hasn't I don't see many case studies from, from an employer's point of view. So let me know, uh, folks, if you've tried this or you want to try it. I mean, I, I'd be interested to know who else apart from Crouton does this actually. Um, all right. Let's get on with it. Um, we're going to be talking about how to do, how to build an elite talent analytics function. Before we bring our amazing guests on, Adam, I'm pretty certain you know nothing about this. Um, just confirm your level of literacy here. Nothing? I can follow the conversation and I know the benefits, but I certainly can't tell anybody any best practices. So hands Excellent. up. 
Excellent. I know as much as you on this one. Excellent. This is what I like. Um, let's bring on some folks who do know something about it um, and they can educate the pair of us uh, on this. Um, okay, so I'm going to bring on Perret. Let's bring on Facundo as well. Um, and I think Ali is with us also. Let's see whether that is the case. Yes, they are. Let's just do that real quick. Boom. Everyone's got their full names on as well, so we don't have the uh, potential scandal to deal with. Um, but everyone's got cool names as well. So they're all, hey, there she is. Perez, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. It has long been ages. I know. I was about to say, long time no see. So it's wonderful to see you and great to have you on the show. Um, and we've got everyone here as well. Great. Why don't we do some intros? Perez, you go first. Um, oh, we have some massive feedback from somebody there. Uh, who is that? Uh, Perez, that might be you. Um, let me just... Um... Oh, it was probably Ali, wasn't it? um yeah so ali you need to <laughs> plug in your mic <laughs> okay uh Perret, let's go with you first uh, can you quickly introduce yourself who are you what it is you do hey uh, my name is pirat uh, i'm from estonia uh, i lead the function of talent analytics sourcing and the research at Nortel. i'm one of the founders of the recruitment community in estonia called recruitment Thursday, and uh, i am a bit data nerd. I do procrastination on data, uh, meaning that if I have something that uh, I need to push forward around the corner, then I usually go into the different data sheets. That's me. Thank you. Am amazing. No, great to have you on the show, uh, Perret. And by the way, wonderful community you have in Tallinn. I uh, look forward to the day when I've, I get the chance to come back and see you guys. Um, okay, let's go with you, Facundo. Uh, who are you? What it is you do? Hi, everyone. Uh, so actually, you can call me Facu. Um, okay. So I'm originally from Argentina and I relocated to UK uh, in no last November. Uh, so I've been in HR for more than 10 years now. My main background is uh, talent acquisition. So I actually was a recruiter for 10 years. And uh, three years ago, I transitioned to the um, people analytics um, team or roles. Uh, I'm actually have been part as, as, uh, as a data analyst. I've been part of talent acquisition, I've been part of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And lastly, I, I'm part of the people analytics team. Uh, so uh, this transition happened uh, while I've been working for Medallia, uh, that it's uh, an exper experience platform uh, that I've been part for the last uh, five years. Amazing. Thank you very much. I didn't realize actually that was your, your career path as well, Faku. But um, the fact that it is, I think it's interesting because I think a lot of people might be interested in following a career in this space, having yeah. come from operational recruitment. So this would be very educational for us. Okay, Ali, let's, let, let's, let's unmute and see how we go. <laughs> do I need to do that? No. Okay. No, I think, can Ali, can you hear me? You can. Yeah, I think you're still you're muted now. Can you unmute? Oh, I think if you hover over your um your the window, there should be like um a, a, a little mobile pops up, and you could kind of click out of of that. Oh. 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 In any case, I think we'll get there. <laughs> um. I think it's probably on the desktop, isn't it? Um, so Ali, yeah. do you want to... On the window. Yeah, it's on the, on the windows. The so if you hover over your own face mm -hmm. with your cursor, something should pop up and then you should be able to... Uh, no? Toggle a mic. I don't think I can do anything from here. Maybe it rejoining might... will help? Yeah, I think rejoin. Let's give it a rejoin. Let's see how we go. No worries. We're nearly getting there. Folks, let me know what you think about a career path in analytics. How many of you have thought about this? Um, how many of you are working in recruitment and think, you know what, not only am I getting into it, but you find yourself getting into it more. Um, it'll be quite interesting to hear. Okay. Can you hear me? We can. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, we've got you there. That's great. Um, why don't you quickly introduce yourself, Ali? Are you what it is you do? Great, thank you. Yeah, my name is Allie Blyer. I work at Takeda Pharmaceuticals. I am the lead of the 
people analytics consulting team. So we have a few different teams within our people analytics um, at Takeda. Uh, I've been working in the field about eight years now. And prior to that, I was um, in sociology. And so I have more of the background, um, strategic workforce planning type background. So I think it pairs really well with a lot of our data scientists on the team as well as our IO psychologists. So overall, we have a very nice, well-rounded team at Takeda. That's great. And, and that's probably something we should talk about. Like, what is the journey into this field? In fact, we'll, we'll definitely speak about that a bit later, because I do believe uh, a lot of people are interested in this. Um, but let's let's take it down to the brass tacks. Um, I mean, in terms of this function starting to emerge within sort of the TA and HR functions, um, when did this hap start happening and, and why did it start happening? Because there was a moment of time where it was just simply a thing. It was a spreadsheet within a HR department, wasn't it? Um, and, you know, we weren't talking about it in terms of people analytics or talent analytics. Uh, so do, do you know a little bit of the history of this? Like when did it start emerging and, and what is the theory behind why we care about it? Um, any thoughts? I'll throw it open to anybody here. I can potentially open up. Uh, I think that the, the talent analytics or the recruitment has been evolving quite a lot during the years. And one of the things that uh, every business wants to have is uh, we want to sneak around the corner. We want to see the future. But uh, to actually understand uh, the future, you also need to look at your current flows. You need to understand what are your pipelines, what are your bottlenecks, how you can improve. And if you don't have a data, then you don't know how you're doing and where you could actually improve. So it is uh, the businesses are growing. This is the ambition and uh, strategy uh, from this has been uh, actually involved uh, talent analytics quite a lot as well, I believe. Can you um, sort of um, tell us when the department emerged within your respective companies? Um, so, so if Nortal, for instance, was, did that exist before sort of uh, 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 before your uh, arrival in the business? Uh, same with you, um, uh, Faku, and also Ali. Like, when did these things start happening? Did you see it happen, or was it already sort of in existence when uh, uh, when you joined the business? Yeah, so I can share my my experience here. So. Uh, the people analytics department inside HR uh, in my current company has been uh, for more than five years, I, I would say, and, and basically the need inside the talent acquisition team appeared like three years ago. That is when, you know, uh, I started like my transition from uh, recruiting to, to the data analysis type of role. Um, so I believe that this, uh, this need for uh, you know this role inside TA is basically like an evolution, right? So the business have been becoming data driven in the last ten years. Then you know HR catching up with the the people analytics function inside, and then basically um, it's a matter of time that each each department will have this need of you know, and it's also about this um, how we are specializing, how our knowledge has been getting more deep inside all of these different roles that we have in HR. Um, so yeah, I believe that is part of this trend of, you know, we are all getting like super focused on things and now we have this role inside uh, TA. The, um, thanks Faku. How about, how about you, um, uh, Ali? Uh, explain to me what the, the, the role is within Takeda. So you mentioned it was consulting. Does that mean you're actually consulting externally or, the, or is it consulting within the, uh, the, the, the Takeda itself? Yeah, great question. I'm internal consulting. Uh, so our team has been established in its current form since I started about three years ago. Takeda is interesting. It, uh, it was founded in 1781, so it has a long history, but has not had a people analytics team. Uh, Shire was a company um, that Takeda acquired um, five or so years ago. Don't hold me to that date. But um, and there was a people analytics team at Shire. So my old manager was at Shire. Um, and then started building out the Takeda team um, post-integration. So we're relatively new compared to the history of our organization, um, but really impressed with all the work we've been able to do so far. And in those three years, we've doubled in size and hopefully continuing to grow. Um, and through that, we've built out um, a couple different pillars within People Analytics. So we have the consulting, so that's my team. Um, and we work really closely with our senior HR leaders to think about how to use data to make data-driven decisions. 
we consult on, like how do you think about metrics and KPIs and data and how do you use our tools and technology and translate some of the great work that uh, my colleagues do, maybe that might be a little bit more advanced to, for an HR colleague. Uh, and so we help kind of uh, put that in, in HR terms uh, for them. And then we have our research team that does great advanced analytics, a survey, uh, survey team, as well as our BI uh, team of one, but uh, that helps build out our dashboards. Yeah, very interesting. So essentially, I'm getting a sense from each of your stories here that there is a kind of, there's a scale that's associated to this, right? So if you're a small business, does it make sense to create a, a specific function? Answer no. Um, but there probably is a certain scale where it actually becomes really essential. And then, you know, where is that sort of, the, where is the point at which companies or businesses start thinking about needing this? Um, because I think most people who uh, um, uh, are watching this probably are working in, the size of businesses where this function doesn't exist. Um, is there a particular headcount number where you think, you know what, if your head, head, head was 5,000 people, probably there needs to be some sort of like anal people analytics function in there. Do you, have you got a, a theory on this or do you have a, an intuition as to what that number will be? I don't know if there's a magic number. Um, Give me a magic me. number, Ali. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's going to be truthfully hard to do statistical analyses when you have small headcount, right? Um, especially if you're trying to do analyses by function and you're already a small company. Um, so it becomes uh, less and less statistically significant. But um, if you think about something from like a strategic workforce planning uh, perspective, um, if you're doing massive growth, to me, that's a perfect opportunity to be, have a function um, and you'll need a good, strong data foundation in order to do strategic workforce planning well. Um, and I feel like workforce planning is probably something this group is, is interested in because I think there's a very um, strong connection with talent acquisition. So we can definitely get into that as well. But um, so I think if there's major changes taking place, um, we just went through a pandemic, right? I think people analytics plays a really big part in that and thinking about how do we work effectively in this new world, whether it's hybrid, remote, on site, how do we make sure employee well-being is okay during this time, engagement is strong, retention is low. So if you're having any of these big workforce challenges, um, that's where people analytics can come in. So um, maybe I'm biased and I would say any company should have it, but <laughs> Um, I, of course, the bigger the company, the easier it is to do like more advanced work. Sure. Hung, I was yeah. thinking about an answer to that question, not working in this area, of course, but the, the, the answer to that question to me was immediately, it depends how important people are to the organization. And like in terms of how many people they hire, how much of it's like repeat hiring, evergreen hiring, that type of thing. But then every thing that went into my mind, just as Ali was talking there was, there's not really any company this it doesn't apply to. I think I, I think as Ali just said, it, it is important to every com company. I, I can't think of examples of where it wouldn't be. I think I think that's true, but there's a trade off, isn't there? I mean, if if you're um, you know if we had unlimited resource and unlimited time, then you know we'll absolutely have more more data is is better. You know, however, if you are let's say just scrambling around, if you're a one person business, sort of one recruiter, you're hiring for a, you know there's 250 headcount, 250 employees, you're the one recruiter. It's a kind of a normal so, kind of size. Yeah, so you, you're not gonna yeah you're not gonna have the time to be able to develop any skill set with this. Uh, you might have to bring in external consultants, let's say. Perret, you want to say something? There? Yeah, I would a uh, little bit kind of add additional question on top of that. It's like, uh, what do we mean by the talent analytics anyways? So, uh, because in the people analytics, you have so many different uh, narratives that you can talk. You can uh, tell the story. What is data? Data is just a number somewhere in the Excel or in the Power BI or some dashboard. But uh, the actual story, uh, what you are telling through those numbers, this is the important part. And I would say that uh, if you are sole recruiter, then you still need to have your data. You need to understand that what is the workload, how much I can do, where does it make sense to actually go into the market, where it doesn't, and et cetera, et cetera. And what do I look and what is the work that I need to put in to deliver the results? So this is the one way. And as a sole recruiter, you would, if you're a good recruiter, then you would do this anyways. 
So if the load is growing, you have more people and you grow uh, in this sense that uh, you grow organically. In one point, you understand that, okay, this team cannot, uh, the questions are already getting so big that I cannot answer those questions all by myself. And then you will start building a team. So it is this kind of logical step-by-step uh, -step flow for me. Perez doesn't realize this, but she's just condemned my prior career as being uh, uh, at best mediocre. Uh, <laughs> when I was working as a solo recruiter, I was like, yeah, well, well, I had no clue what I was doing. Anyway, that's, that's, fair, that's fair comment. Sorry about that. That's absolutely fair comment. Um, okay, so there's going to be a bunch of people here that are working as a solo recruiter. I think it's still the dominant sort of, if you're working in internal recruiting, it's still probably the dominant experience you have, that you're the, you're the first person in or, you know, you're working as a, as a solo person. What kind of things can they do to get on this journey, um, practically speaking? Because let's not forget, they've got to do all the recruiting. Obviously, they end up doing a lot of HR stuff as well. They have to do all of the EB stuff, all the DE and IB stuff. So they've got loads on their plate. Um, is there any like quick and dirty way where they can say, right, this is how we get started with this, or is there a tool that can move forward with it? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? So I would say um, that if you are a solo recruiter and you, you're more definitely interacting with an ATS or a sheet, so it's already that the, the data is already accessible for you. So for me, the most basic skill that it's something that you could actually acquire is, you know, Excel or Google Sheets, like basic formulas, pivot table, you know, getting getting that uh, spreadsheet uh, skill, like one leap, one level up, that that is where, you know, where, where you start to realize how powerful it is to actually start connecting different data sets. And I believe from there, it's like you, you, you could follow like different paths. But once you start to realize how how easy it is actually to start to get like insights that you know, it's just a, like a really simple formula or a really simple people table. So I would say that Excel and Google Sheets, uh, it's the like the most uh, easy way. And we are we are already working with those tools, right? Um, so yeah, that, that is my, my suggestion, so like, like a very low hanging fruit. I, I would agree oh, here as well. Uh, just uh, what you need to put on place is that uh, you have the data that you want to track and um, it can be in a simple Excel sheet. Is it the recruitment start date or the request date? Uh, what is the time you are spending in between? So when the recruitment request is coming in and when you actually start the recruitment, you can call this as a preparation time. So you're measuring this, how long this, how much time does it take? Where are the bottlenecks? Then from the recruitment start, you have the, I don't know, next date is, uh, first contact with the candidate or uh, first date uh, when you made an offer out, offer accepted, and you start measuring those step by step. And then the more you have data, the more you will start looking at this data as, uh, as a pattern. And you see, and you, you start to ask the questions. So what is why this type of role takes so much longer uh, to hire or why this location takes so much longer to hire? Why this hiring manager included in this process uh, involves like longer time or shorter time, what they're doing differently. So you start noticing those patterns. So if you start with those easy steps, then uh, the more you evolve, the more questions you have, the more curious you become, then you will add another layer and another layer. So it evolves. <laughs> You know what? This is, um, I mean, this is just the, the this is a, the, the data driven story, isn't it? Like, how do how do we become more data driven? I think all of us are familiar with uh, with, with that um, kind of concept, um, and very very few recruiters would ever would ever contest the value of becoming more data driven. Um, and what we're saying here is simply we have to do more documentation, have to do more recording. Gavin, quite right. How do you capture the data? Ideally, it will be automated in some way or you create a system um, that automatically collects this. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, without it, you're probably going to have to just manually do it, which is obviously not ideal. Um, but um, the tools are getting better. Um, and obviously, everyone's keeping an eye on what's going on. I mean, ChatGBT has to be mentioned at some point any of these generative AI tools that are out there 
should actually help tremendously with regards to reducing the workload, with regards to capturing data, manipulating data as it comes through. Um, so, um, so yeah, Steve, quite right. Modern ATSs, I think they know the value of this. So um, if you're using an ATS today, um, then I guess get good at the reporting suite of that. Um, or at least if you're making a decision on the ATS, um, it should be. It shouldn't be just a, a peripheral decision you're making. Um, it should be one of the central features of the product. Um, can you actually get data from it? Um, that's useful for you to make decisions. Um, okay, let's do like. Go on, Adam. You say something. I wanted to talk about like what's the ROI from doing this, and what are the objectives, and like what are the success stories? What is it we're? I mean, I, I, yeah. What what is it we're getting out of this that's tangible? That can make our company Im like improve the way it operates. Yeah, I can give a couple great, I think, talent acquisition examples. So, uh, uh, from like more advanced work, if you can get into more of the analytics, um, you can make really big business impact. And so, one example is um, in my prior company, I did an analysis about talent hiring pools, and so we were struggling with high turnover in a particular critical role. Um, so you're always hiring, right? Trying to backfill. We're lo losing sales. You're always onboarding, training, et cetera. The recruiters are really frustrated because they just feel like the, we're, we're bleeding the talent. They just keep hiring and hiring the same role over and over. So it's like, okay, let's take Let's pause and let's look at those different talent pools to see what are the most effective pools that we sh maybe we need to adjust our uh, sourcing strategy. So we looked at to see, okay, based off of the different talent pools, First, are they an internal or external hire? If they were internal, what functions or departments do they come from? If they were external, we could look at their resumes to see, are they coming from the same background? Are they coming from sales, but a different industry? Are they coming from something completely different? And then let's track them over time um, to understand, are they staying at the company and what do their sales look like? So then I can understand the, the business impact for those particular employees or talent pools to see, okay, which are better um, at staying and the sales. So that um, the output of that result was, or that analysis was, you know, we're actually doing really well with our internal hires. Let's think about how we can create better career paths and opportunities for other people in the organization. Let's break down any barriers that people might have so that they can come into this critical role and help with training and onboarding and different support like that. And then externally, we found that there were a couple of talent hiring pools that uh, we didn't think were great from anecdotal evidence, but the data actually said otherwise. So then it's like, okay, how do we change those strategies to, to try to target those, um, those different types of employees? And that then actually reduced turnover and increased sales. So there can be really big business impacts. Um, if you're a smaller shop, I don't think you're necessarily gonna be able to do that, um, but you can identify areas of like, why are we struggling with um, time to fill? Is it maybe a hiring manager that is, is the talent? Is it the location? Is it the market? Is it the skills? So there are some other tangible questions with um, smaller organizations that you can try to target. Yeah, that's a brilliant example. It's it's almost like a lot of the um, uh, sort of conclusions that we might have a kind of intu intuitions that you know may or may not be true, um, but being yeah. able to actually uh, collect the, the data on it can either prove that case or it could be more revealing of these kind of hidden things that you didn't know was true, um, particularly when you go down to the granularity of it and realize actually, yes, this phenomenon is happening, but it's happening particularly with this group of people and not with this group of people. And then mm -hmm. that can obviously inform your decision making. So I think pretty straightforward where there's business value to it. Um, let, let's, we're going to do a hard shift into how do you actually set up a department and make it a, a, a good one uh, in a second. Uh, but before we get there, um, we're always going to try and do this in the middle of every show, folks, uh, because Brain Food Live does have to come off air at some point. Um, and it's a terrible thing if we are a bottleneck for a conversation that you want to continue and have elsewhere. So um, why don't we just take a moment? We want to make sure everyone is able to continue this conversation with people that also care about it. Um, take a moment now, grab your LinkedIn URL and share it into the chat stream on Crowdcast or share it into whatever sort of a comment thread you happen to be in part of right now. So I know loads of people are watching it on LinkedIn because uh, we're doing this multi kind of uh, 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 distribution on, on different places. Perez, I think you've done it as well, which is awesome. Um, so. <laughs> 
share your your linkedin in whatever thread you're watching it and then make sure you're connecting with everyone who does the same um i had a conversation earlier today earlier today, earlier this week um about how, why it's important to grow your linkedin network in a, in a quality and control way um and loads of people don't have any like innovative ideas on how to do it but if you join brain food live and watch the show basically you're going to get 50, 40 50 new sort of free connections of high quality like who else is going to watch a, a a live stream on recruiting on a friday afternoon um other than enthusiasts on recruiting they're the people you want to talk to so go and connect with everyone there you're going to walk away with a, a strengthened sort of network um which is uh, never a bad thing so more is merrier um, okay, let's do a hard acceleration to how do you set up a good one? I mean, have you have you set up a bad function before? I mean, I, you know, obviously, you don't you know if, if it's your current system function and you know make, make some fictional example. But how 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 do I get it wrong? So I want to do this. Um, I've got I've got budgets. I've got a team. I want to get going with it. Like, what do I need to do to make sure that it doesn't go wrong? What are the first steps? The building blocks of this um perhaps you got any thoughts on on that let's, we're gonna go around on it but let's go with you first i i think that uh regarding this uh one of the key learnings for me on the journey has been that uh, definitely you need to have the business behind that uh that uh, they support this this type of uh additional value and they understand that what what the value is there but another learning is also the vocabulary that you're using, uh, the consistency inside of the organization. So uh, if you're measuring something, if you are uh, showing data, then you are comparing apples with apples, not apples with oranges. So the vocabulary needs to be agreed that if you're talking about the time to hire, then what does it mean? In one organization, it may be measured by one type of the actions in between and in other organization, it may uh, be something different. And the one thing also that we always want to do is that uh, we want to measure how we are doing. And then we also, of course, we want to see that what others are doing, how and where are we compared with others. But if you don't know the exact data points that are measured, then uh, you don't know what you are actually uh, comparing. So the vocabulary uh, and the business uh, buying needs to be there. All right. Some brilliant examples. Folks, make notes on this. I think everyone's going to come up with some really great, great sort of things to talk about. Uh, the business back, uh, sort of backing, we all know that, right? So let's. I'm going to skip over that real quick. But you have to win sort of the argument. You've got to get the backing because if you try and just build this, no one knows what you're doing. That's just a change management error. You've got to get their buy-in before you get in. So number one, we know this. Secondly... The, the the vocabulary has got to be correct. So you've got loads of like uh, metrics out there. Does it mean the same thing to everybody? Time to hire is a classic one. Is it when the requisition is actually made? Is it when you post the advert? Um, is it when do, when do you know you need the role? Um, is it when it appears in the ATS? Um, you know, let, let's make sure we have a clear definition. So I guess the way to do that is to actually have a glossary at one point. So a consultation period, um, everyone has to kind of contribute to that consultation. But at some point, someone's going to say, look, this is what we mean by this metric. Um, mm -hmm. And if you want to talk about something else, then please, you know, you got to use a different term. So get the taxonomy right, get the terminology right. Yeah, um, also, if uh, I may add one final thing from my side also, which is uh, really important, is that uh, if uh, within the recruitment teams, if we start talking about the data, then uh, quite often the first impression is like, so you want to start measuring me? Or uh, it's like the um, it's uh, you. It is. It's not the fright per se, but it is this kind of why, what I'm doing good, and etc. But the data is not there to uh, be your enemy. Data is there to actually protect you and uh, teach you and give you also the platform to learn and develop. So uh, those data topics and those discussions within the team as well that why do we do what do we do uh, and the transparency around that this is also really crucial okay so there's basically four things there um the the the, the, the final thing that Pret mentioned was very very important is that the team itself as in the recruitment team may actually have resistance to this concept because they see it's like oh it's more performance management um and and that's not what the purpose is the purpose is look we're going to try and identify where the issues are within the system so that we can apply better sort of solutions to it rather than just like go through the grind 
Um, so I guess there's a, there's a communication process and also the getting the buy-in also needs to include the team as well. It's not just the, the, the leader of the organization saying, we're now rolling this out. You've got to bring the team along with you. Um, okay. And, and the third thing, I don't want to forget just to remind, but the third thing that Pratt mentioned was that you ultimately want to get to a point where you can benchmark against competition um, so you get some sort of sense as to where you are if you're recruiting against direct competitors, um, either in industry, in region, or in, for a role and stuff like this. Um, okay, Faku, let's go to you. Um, what other things um, do you think uh, need to go into place the, at the very start uh, of, of the process when you're building the function um, that's going to help uh, help you succeed in the long term? Yeah, so I believe that uh, there needs to be some clear expectations of what deliverables will um, will mean like, you know, you are being successful, you are doing well. So, you know, setting those expectations, like clear, clear expectations. And I believe that, you know, being able to start showing results in maybe the first quarter, right? So by so what, what could we expect by the end of, you know, a quarter of uh, this function? Uh, so the, that first um, period of time, it's far, for me, it's vital. So everyone understands, you know, start to actually see the fast results of why we are doing that. Uh, so that for me, it's it's like very important uh, having like those clear expectations. And, and if you are doing this, you have a network. You can actually start reaching to your network to ask, right? So what what could we expect in in in, in like in a short period of time? So I would rely if, if you don't have anyone against to, you know, to to benchmark, you know, in, inside your company, go to your network and start like asking, you know, what 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 do you do in, in those that for a period of time? Because that that first period for me, it's it's vital. And I would say um, on regards of this uh, role, I believe, as I mentioned before, that this could be like a really good opportunity for someone in your team to be developed. So it's for me, it's a, a really good uh, career development opportunity. Uh, if your team is uh, big enough and you have maybe that person in, in, already in your team that it's likes numbers, likes metrics, it's, it might be already running some numbers. So um, I don't know, that, that is my suggestion that could happen also. It, it could be like a, a potential career development for someone of, that is already in your team. Faku, well, what would be there, the... Re... Go ahead. Faku, what would be the, um, what would be the sort of um elements of let's say somebody coming from a recruitment background what would the kind of behaviors and like interests that they have be most likely to go hang on you should be working in this area yeah 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 so i mentioned before this excel or um, google sheets uh, formula skills you can develop that but what i believe are good skills some things that will make you give you a hint that this person might be good for it is um, attention to detail, um, problem solving, because uh, in the end, I believe that this role, even though they are, you're interacting with data sets and ITS, um, I, I don't know, this is my day-to-day -day job, and I believe that uh, I, I face technical challenge on, on a daily basis, right? So on, 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 on behind the curtains, uh, when you are talking about um, talent analytics, even though we are talking about people, even though we're talking about talent acquisition, these are technical challenges. And there are some people that like technical challenges. So coming back, you know, problem solving, ensuring technical challenges, attention to detail. And, and one thing for me that it's really important is that this person is people oriented because it's very easy to get lost with the numbers and you forget that you're talking about people. So maybe it's contraintuitive what I'm mentioning, but you need someone that actually cares about people because uh, when you start talking about numbers and, 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 and metrics, it's again, it's very easy to forget that, you know, it's, it's people. So having that connection, so that balance between this numerical side and this people size, I believe that that is, uh, what it takes to be success successful. I'm going to generalize here a little bit, but I think you've just described the typical talent sourcer. Okay. They're good at they're good at okay. looking under rocks. They're good at trying lots of different things. They're good at using technology to create solutions. They're good yeah. at using data. So I, yeah. I think that's a good background, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I was well, a talent sourcer. That. I could definitely connect you know when when i was trying to do some cat hunting where i find it how i found the email that type of things that you know get you really excited 
Yeah. No, it was my, my case. At least uh, I, I get that type of excitement also working with, with the, the metrics. Yeah. So yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's someone who basically a, a technical source or someone who gets into it and lost into the sourcing, I think is the right thing. I do disagree. You need to be a people person though. I think you could have a completely anti-social personality and be a, a hugely <laughs> successful analytics person. Um, I just want to open it out there for people who are, you know, uh, misanthropes. Um, this is a career path that could be very good for you as well. Um, okay, um, uh, let's go to uh, just a quick, quickly restrict what Faki said, um, which I thought was uh, really, really important. The expectation setting, like when you're setting up the function, um, all right, you're doing this and you're getting on with it, but the business needs to know what the heck they're going to get from this and can you secure a quick win? Uh, so we know that this is a long-term value, but sometimes in order to give yourself the chance of that long-term happening, you just got to give, throw some sugar to the crowd, so to speak. You got to give them something early um, and to make sure that, you know, the pressure comes off you just somewhat. Um, I think a really good tip for any change management anyway, but I think very valid here. Um, Ali, you got you got the short end of the stick because uh, Perret and Faku have said some amazing things. Have you got anything else that you can add to what they said? Uh, how do you set up a great function? How do you avoid making mistakes? You know, and setting up something that would kind of fail or, or, or struggle as you as, as it goes on. Yeah, the one other thing I would add is keep data ethics and data privacy top of mind. There's lots of restrictions, right? There's work councils, there's GDPR, um, and there's also like how do you want employees to feel about how their data is being used? So at my company, we keep this in the front of the mind of every project that we're doing. And to your point earlier, it's people are behind these data points, right? So how can we make employees feel comfortable with what we're doing? So anytime we're doing an analysis using um, like new data sources, we do ask for consent and we explain how this data is being used. Um, there's so many different use cases for various data points. And sometimes we might get a little frustrated of, oh shoot, we asked for consent to use it in this way. We would love to do something else, but you know, we didn't ask for that consent. So no, we can't do that unless we ask for permission. Again, um, all of our surveys have really um, elaborate consent and making sure employees understand how we're using data. Um, for example, we only ever share results in aggregate. So like that uh, example I just shared earlier of understanding talent pools, I'm not looking to see, okay, Allie Blyer, she was here uh, for two years and this, these were her sales. Um, that's not kind of the business we're in. It's more understanding and aggregate. So it's okay. Allie's background was sales. Great. Let's look at all of the sales. How are they, do, how are those employees doing over time? Um, and also like none of the, we don't necessarily do reporting, but all of the like presentations and sharing out it's on aggregate. Um, and it, it, it is hard when we've in the past, we've had the CEO saying, oh, this number is scary to me. Can you tell me the team or people? And we've had to tell the CEO, no, we can't, uh, which is a little bit scary to do. But like we really uphold the ethics that we that we have in place. So um, definitely consider that as well as you're building it out. That's really, really important point. And folks, by the way, we're running out of time now, but if you have any questions for our guests, please use the ask a question feature at the bottom of the screen. We're going to get to that in a second. Uh, but Ali, I just want to thank you for um, your uh, uh, your underlining of the point on data ethics. I think, I, I forget where I read this this report, but it was, it was related to AI and automation. But I think similar, it's adjacent to what we're doing here, where you've got something new coming into a business um, and you basically get hostility or at least ambivalence stroke hostility from the rest of the employee base if they don't feel comfortable with what you're doing. Um, so you've got to get them involved. You've got to have an explanation that they can understand as to why you're getting this, uh, this data. Um, you've got to give assurances and stick by them. As you mentioned, Ali, uh, even if it means facing up to the CEO, um, imagine if you actually did disclose who it was and, and that actually was leaked internally. Also, you're never going to get anybody cooperating with you again, uh, because it's a, it's a huge betrayal, um, of a, of a promise that was made. Um, so all of these things, I think, are, are really important, uh, not not to tack on, but really to bake into your approach before you go on. Um, uh, this data is powerful, it's important, and there's a huge responsibility uh, associated with it if you're going to get the consent of the people um, to give it to you. Um, so so that's a very, very critical part of how, how this works. Okay. Um, let's go to the questions. Um, my attempt to solicit questions has generated no extra questions, which is great. Um, we've just got one residual question to deal with, um, and this is from Megan. 
Uh, let's uh, let's read this out. Megan saying, okay, curious about how you benchmark against competition with respect to uh, PA. Well, uh, what, people what analytics. Uh, people analytics, yeah. Rec ops and TI metrics. How do you benchmark against competition? Okay, so I guess maybe one of these things is, like, doesn't everyone have different metrics? And Perret, to your point, maybe they have the same terminology, but it actually means something different. So is that even feasible to compare across uh, different co companies when there isn't really a consistency of how you how, how you do the measurements? It's really hard. Uh, that's the reason because there is no this kind of universal uh, module how uh, data is measured or how it is uh, presented as well. So that's why it's, it's definitely hard. But uh, how you can do and why uh, networking is really important is that uh, you go to your peers in the market and uh, you ask how they are doing. And uh, if you have a good enough relationship, uh, if you have strong enough community in your location, then uh, you can actually get this information and, uh, and then you can actually dig deeper as well and ask like, okay, your data, uh, what, how do you measure? What do you do there? So uh, this, this is the essence, but there is no one universal uh, truth. Uh, there are some uh, reports that uh, big providers or the tools also applicant tracking systems are uh, producing. But again, uh, this, this is uh, something that uh, you cannot put the finger on exactly always that uh, what is the timestamp where is the beginning? Where is the end? Yeah, that's really good. I mean, basically, um, it, uh, communication with your colleagues, um, I think, can, can ev you can evolve a standard through that dialogue, can't you? Because, you know, why reinvent the wheel? If someone's actually deployed something and it makes sense, then, okay, let's go with this. Um, w w where would you suggest people connect? I mean, obviously, people can connect with you guys here. We're doing the show. But are there online spaces that, you know, particularly focus on this that are worth you know, people join that space or join a newsletter somewhere that focuses on this. Um, where would they be educated uh, on, on on people analytics? Um, regarding talent analytics, I don't have anything really specific to offer, but there is a really uh, interesting group that is uh, around Toby Call Show, which is related to the talent intelligence. So uh, that might be definitely uh, a pool where to tip in and uh, and read uh, about this topic as well, because it, it opens the full another world uh, outside of talent analytics and the talent analytics and talent intelligence they are different beasts you know yeah it is slightly different but i think you're right talent intelligence collective by toby is a really really good uh, community and it will include a lot of the people even though there are differentiations yeah it, people who are interested in data and people generally speaking will aggregate towards there i think david green on linkedin has got an amazing newsletter a big summary thing um mm -hmm. i've asked people analytics but again um someone pull up david's um uh, newsletter and share it in the chat through i think that's really good well done ali thank you so much for sharing that as well um absolutely yeah um join these groups folks um this is going to help you uh, get on um, okay we've got a couple more questions coming through so let's just blast through this real quick um okay rob say okay what do you do when you in in inherited data um so joining a business uh, ats is there but it's a mess obviously no one's like maintained it or whatever uh do you, do you start again do you think right nothing happened prior to me turning up um or do you, do you spend time digging into it how do you make that decision i mean sometimes it, it does it makes sense not to look at it right it's a complete mess it's like i, I don't mm -hmm. have the time uh what are your thoughts have you got an experience um anybody want to share some how about you faku you want to answer this one uh, yeah, so I, I actually had that experience where I, when, when I started my, uh, like, uh, started transitioning, you know, I, back then I was using Lever and, you know, I, I, I had to figure out how to export. So it's like, it took me like a, the, the, that first quarter that I, I mentioned when I started doing this, it was me dealing with a system where I have like really few support because the person that set this up and, you know, the, the former members, weren't there, right? So it was it was me with the system figuring out. Um, so that th those are things that happen. Uh, so it, it's going to depend on how much time you can invest on those things. It would be ideal to you know hit hit the button and reset, but that is not the reality. Maybe you're with an AGS um, for for a long run, so you will have to eventually uh, figure out how things are working. And, and if you are working actually with an ATS, you you might have this um, support people that should uh help you with that figuring out how to do you know 
where this information is living, what these columns that I'm looking over here means, and, and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's something that you eventually will have to um, have to face, right? Someone no. follow someone else. Um, I, 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 yeah, I get it. Fuck you. I, I think there's a couple of things here. Um, I mean, firstly. I mean, we don't choose our tools often, right? So we have to sometimes just uh, 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 sort of take what we're given. Um, and we don't always have the option. Um, and I guess you just got to estimate the amount of time you've got to deal with it um, and, and kind of work around sort of that. So don't assume you have the toolkit. Um, there's, a, there's a company that deals with some migrations, Data Migrator, um, a friend of mine called Gerald Morgan. Maybe he's someone to speak to if you have a residual system you want to move to, you want to get some of the data out, you want some support, that organization might be able to help you with it. Um, okay, final question is going to go to you, Ali. Um, we're going to go, how do you measure people anal at the analytics function in terms of performance? Um, so we're looking at, uh, this is a meta analysis, right? So how do we uh, analyze ourselves? Um, we will set this thing up. Um, you know, we've, we've got this uh, function uh, firing. How do we know it's working? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of metrics as a data person. I love metrics, right? You can get very granular to understand, okay, how many requests did we get? What was our SLA? All those sorts of things. For me, I think more about the impact. So for me, it's more of the qualitative insights of um, do my HR partners and business leaders feel like we're making a, an impact to their organization? So for me, that's really what I look to in making sure that the HR community feels like they know how to use data. They know how to make their own insights. Um, for me, a, a wins are always when uh, insights from my team can help drive policy changes um, at the organization. So anytime I see that, I, I view that as a success. So um, I think it's a mix, qualitative and quantitative. Um, reporting uh, teams are going to be a, a little bit easier to measure from those like SLA type um, type requests. So I think it just depends on like what your outcomes are. So always start with like, what are you trying to solve for? For me, it's those those large um, workforce um, workforce decisions. So it's, it's understanding can we make an impact there? Yeah, I, I think that actually might be a simpler question to answer. Uh, yeah, then we uh, we might first appear, isn't it? It's like, what is the purpose of the function in the, in, in the first place? Are we making that impact? Is re recruiting improving as a result of some of our recommendations and our work? And that will tell you uh, whether, whether it was working or not. But in the interim, on your journey there, I think the requisitions you get or the, the interactions you have with the business might be a reasonable proxy as well. Like if you find yourself just sitting there chucking reports over a fence, probably not very, not so great. Um, but if you, you get managers or CEOs or people like that interacting with you with interest, um, then you can say, OK, um, you know, we are making something of a splash. Folks, we are out of time. We're well over as usual. So people have got lives to lead. Not me, by the way. I don't have any life to lead, but our friends on the panel do. Um, so let's got to let, let those folks go. Um, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks to our guests, firstly. Perrette, great to see you. Um, wonderful to have you on the show. We'll surely get you back uh, if you're up for it. Uh, Faku, great to see you as well. Thank you for making your debut on Brave Through Live. Um, and Ali, thanks for coming on also, making your debut also. Wonderful to have you all on the show. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful uh, rest of the day, guys. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hank, Thank you. for inviting. That was great, huh? <clears throat> yep, those sessions are really good uh, because you'll, well, you learn something every session, but I mean, that was one that I didn't know an awful lot about. Great to yeah. find out a lot more. We've been educated yeah. there. I think that was good. Um, and, and we managed to actually get into almost like a step-by-step -step how to, which basically, you know, if, if someone uh, wrote that down, um, might actually be a very useful just checklist um, to make sure that, uh, that, that you're doing, uh, doing what you should be. Um, so, so, yeah, I thought that was a really good session. I mean, jobs in this area are going to really grow because um, it, it, it's just a great way of getting the information we need to make the robots work the way we need them to work. Yes, um, indeed. you know, as we inevitably progress away from 360 degree recruitment and into specialists looking after elements of the pipeline and elements of the process and all that sort of thing. Um, I think 360 might come back, more. man. A 360 might come back. The difference is with, with that 360 person will have like an army of bots working for them. 
um, and dealing with the specialities. Um, so your job will almost be herding these like uh, AIs doing various things. Um, so yeah, an AI shepherd, uh, let's say. Um, I wouldn't anyway, say that's a 360 degree recruiter. Though. That's a that's a that's a robot master. Yeah, a robot master isn't doing any recruiting. Maybe that's the future. Um, okay, folks, that's it. Thanks for watching. We're back next week. We're going to also talk about um, uh, some analysts. We're going to talk about how to measure quality of hire next week. Um, so we could even get the same panelists on, but we're not. We're going to get other people on that know even more about this topic. Um, how do you measure the quality of hire? Um, that's a big topic. I think all of us uh, are right up there. So make sure you follow the channel if you're interested in that. Follow my LinkedIn if you're also uh, can't be bothered with uh, the, the Crowdcast sign up because I'll broadcast it from there um, and uh, register on the show when you see it. Um, okay, that's it. See you next week. Cheers. All right.